you walk into a mall, you'll look at 100, you, you'll, you'll walk by about 150 stores that are telling you who you should be, right? They're telling you, you should be this, you should wear this, and they're selling you, nothing wrong with the mall, it's fine, I, I, but I'm just giving you a little picture. <laughs> I, I like one of the mall. But, but it's, you know, it's telling us, you know, who, who we should be. And if we look here in the scripture, I'm going to read it right now, and then um, um, I'll get into the teaching portion, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I call this message Purpose in Your Heart. Because I think it's very important, right? Daniel was determined to remain who he was. No matter what shifted around him, no matter how he, where he moved to, or no matter what, ha- what was going on around him, and, and he determined to stay the man that God had called him to be. Amen? And we're going to see that in here. We're going to see a few things in here that how the, how, how, how the world and, and, and the culture and current events and all these things can affect us, and especially for parents. How, how are things, you know, I, I'm, I have, I, I'm married. This summer will be 13 years. I'm married to my, my beautiful wife, Abby. Um, we have a blended family. We have five children. And, um, you know, looking, you know, at, at the things that are every day bombarding them, whether they're out playing, whether they're um, on their iPads, you know, whether they're watching a movie, even if I you know, I, I pick the movies, you know, w- they can get through things sometimes, you know, and, and other things can, I, I was watching this, uh, my daughter was watching this cartoon the other day, and uh, I'm, I'm sitting on the table, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I turned my head, and I go, that doesn't, that doesn't look familiar, and then it showed these two teenagers kiss on a cartoon, and I'm like, whoa, 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 she's, she's, she's nine now, but, it, but you know, she was eight, I said, you can't watch that, honey, you know, we're not going to explain to her, but, you know, we can, we, can, we can do everything to try to keep them separate physically. But if you have any sort of electronic device in your house, you have a window, a door, <laughs> a radio, it's going to get in. So we have to teach them. Invest, and disciple. And it's hard. I know it's hard here in the Silicon Valley because a lot of us work a lot of time, and I just, I had a friend of mine pray for me, pray that I spend more time with investing in my children, that they would walk with me. We don't hear about Daniel's father in, in the book of Daniel, or his mother, or his, any of his family members, but we know that they invested in him because we see the fruit of that in this. So I'm going to read through all of chapter one, so bear with me. My glasses are, keep getting a little foggy. Um... In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily portion of the king's delicacies, and the wine in which he drank, and three years of training for them so that that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. I had a Spanish accent, and I don't even speak Spanish (laughs) when I said that. That was a joke. Uh, (laughs) But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested 
of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom, whom the chief of the eunuchs has set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let the appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And, you, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter and f in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And thus the steward took away their portion of the delicacies and wine th that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the, end of the at the end of the days, when the king said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in the realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, that your word, Lord, would be magnified in this place. You'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father God. Give us ears to hear and hear and minds and hearts to understand what you're saying to us today, Lord God. Father God, I pray, Lord God, that I would decrease and you would increase. And may the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. The choices you make today can affect you for the rest of your life, whether good or bad, right? We think about this, right? These men, these young men, their whole world had been rocked, just kind of something like mine, right? In, in a different way. Mine was rocked through divorce, and there was rocked through something way bigger, through a war. And, and, and they were besieged, and, 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 and their whole land was taken. They were taken into a, a strange land. And, and I look at this, and I think, wow, this is, this is amazing, the things they had to go through. And when you think about the timing of Daniel, I, I took some notes here. You know, he lived in the 6th century before the birth of Jesus. During um, a, a period of time, the construction of the Acropolis in Athens began. The Mayan civilization flourished in Mexico. Aesop wrote his fables. Confucius and Buddha lived. Greek art began to truly excel, and the Phoenicians made the first known sea journey around Africa. The Greeks introduced olives to Italy. So this is during that time when Daniel lived. So you get like a little bit of a picture. I, you know, sometimes we don't think about what's going on when we're reading the word outside, but you know, I'm thinking about the Mayan civilization flourishing and Confucius and Buddha living during this time. And there's this wise man in the middle of all of this, you know, in the Middle East. And God's using him. You know, um, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem at the end of the third year of uh, Jehoiakim's reign. And he took the city in the fourth year, 606 B.C., and we see that, you know, he took all the articles of God and all the things of them because he wanted to show the, the people of Israel that they were conquered, that it was, it was done, right? And he's pulling all these people in. And the interesting thing about it is, like, I don't know how many nobles, I don't know, we don't, the Bible doesn't tell us, well, maybe it does somewhere, but how many nobles, you know, how many of the king's children or descendants there were that were of that age? But the interesting thing, there could have been hundreds, right? We only hear four. We don't know what happened to the rest. The Bible doesn't tell us. And whatever I say is speculation, but we never hear about what happened to the other people except for these guys during that time. The reason I say that is sometimes it's easy when you move to a new place, a new city, a new school, a new job. Um, 
to be influenced by that culture around you. Um, you know, so many people I pray with, and even myself I deal with, you know, I used to be a church, pa- you know, pastoring at a church. I was at a church every day, and then now I'm out in the streets, and I have to deal with traffic. You guys all know Bay Area traffic, right? That's where the Lord deals with me the most when I'm driving through traffic. I didn't have to drive. I had a, I had a five-minute commute before. Now I have an hour commute. That, you, that should take me 15 minutes. And <laughs> a lot has changed in my mouth and in my mouth, my thoughts and, in, and what I say. And I pray that God would give me mercy, to have mercy on me and, and give me grace when I'm driving. Please pray for me. So we look through here and we see what happened and, and the... They, they were given over, and the, how, the things of the house of the Lord were taken in and put in with God. He tried to make the things that were holy, that God had set apart as holy, into common things, with, um, with the, with just put away with, you know, the, the, his other articles of worship, like God was just a God amongst many gods, right? I mean, you could, you, we could think that. This is written in the Word, so they must have known. And, uh, you know, I think it was, it was disrespectful to God. You know, it's happening in our country. You know, we think about it, right? The things of God, you know, we started, you know, we'll, they'll say, like, you know, we started as a Judeo-Christian nation, right? And there was prayer and reading of the Bible, and now it's separation of church and state. And, you know, and I, I saw this, 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 this picture on Facebook one time. It says, they don't want you to read the Bible in school, but when you're incarcerated in prison, it's recommended for you to read the Bible. When it should be the opposite, right? It should be opposite because so they won't end up in that place. And you think about this, that, you know, they're, they're, the things of God were, were of nothing to them. Totally defiling them, making them things that were common. In, in verse 3 and 4, it says, the king, the king instructed Asaph, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children. How do you change a nation? How do you change people? How do you, how do you, how do you change a culture? Through the children. Three years. Imagine three years of being indoctrinated in the Babylonian culture. That would be all they know, right? I, I, I meet a lot of the kids I work with, right? They're, 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 their parents are from Mexico. They're born here. And I, and I watch the, them talk with their parents. Their parents are speaking Spanish, but they're answering in Spanish and English, you know? And the way they think and the way they talk and the way that they, what the music they like, you know, a lot of it is, it's English. Right? And it's so, and, you, and you're seeing that change, the shift, right? Um, my parents spoke Spanish. I don't speak Spanish at all. And so, you know, how, you, know you, you, you change a generation by indoctrinating the youth. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't no fool. He knew how the people were going to serve him as a king, and he fancied himself a god, right? He thought he was to be worshipped. So, how, you know, how else would he, would he change? And, and, and a lot of things are, are changing the culture. I mean, you know, I, can't, I don't have time to get into this, but if you look at the 50s and then the 60s, the transformation from the conservative, you know, um, America, as we saw on TV, right? I mean, I, I wasn't around then, into the sexual revolution. And things just exploded during that time and changed, right? And it was through, how was it? How was, how, where, where, where was this message coming from? The youth, how are the youth reached? Through music, right? And so we think about this, and we think about how what, this, this little picture, we get a little glimpse into history that we get here, and, and, and we see what's going on after they were taken in. And the interesting thing is when they were taken in, they weren't treated as slaves, these people. They were fed, educated. They were accepted, right? They were embraced. Everybody, you know, these, these people were probably taken away from their families. Daniel probably never saw his family again. We, we have no idea, but I can only assume we never hear anything about it. None of these young men saw their family again. You know, one thing that I've, I've, I've known working with youth is that when there's something, when there's some sort of um, separation in families, a lot of them are looking for love. And the kids that I work with, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them find it in gangs. They find it in, in relationships. They just, they go from one to another in relationships and they're just trying to find love and acceptance. So it's, I look at this and I'm like, 
whoa, he really wants to do something, change these people to never go back, never go back to where they came from. These were the good-looking kids. They were brought up in nice houses and trained in the ways of the Lord. We always think of that happening with the, the, the kids that are, that, are not, that are not good, the kids that are getting in trouble. But the focus was for the kids that were the good ones. They were well off. They were doing okay. And that's something to think about also, right? So nobody is, is, is out of the reach of this. That's why we have to continue to share, you know, the, the Word of God. And he looked at these, and he brought these people in, and uh, um, again, there must have been, I, I don't know, hundreds, there could have been thousands. We don't hear about any of them. And it says that, you know, the, 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 for three years, they were trained. It's very interesting, right? Food, names, and education, right? This was again an attempt at total indoctrination working to make these young jewish men leave behind their hebrew god and culture and nebuchadnezzar wanted them to depend on them to depend on him there's a dependency on that feeling a dependency of knowing a dependency of um of being accepted there's so much significance there right we look at the food. Food in the, in the, in the Middle Eastern culture, right, is, is, is a way of fellowship, right? You're breaking bread together, you're eating together. And they were invited into the same food of Nebuchadnezzar to eat the same food that he ate and drink the same wine that he drank. They, their names were changed. So they wouldn't stand out. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be, you know, when you come in and your name's different from everyone else's, right? It, it, it could be hard, right? Well, they, you know, he changed their name so they, they wouldn't have that problem. A nickname, right? None's wrong with nicknames, but I'm just giving you for the sake of this portion of Scripture, right? And then education. I want to educate them so they know all about us, so they feel that they're a part of us, right? Daniel and his friends refuse insisting they looked to God. Amen? They looked to God in everything. They weren't going to feed on what the world has to offer. They weren't going to identify themselves with this world. And they weren't going to educate themselves in the way of this world. They, 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 were, de they were determined to be who God had called them to be. And so this whole, you know, first, you know, um, eight verses... It's giving us that picture, the glimpse into what is going on. This, this goes on in our, in our culture, right? This goes on all around us all the time. There's an indoctrination, right? People have different views. People have different things. And some of these things are contrary to the Word of God. That's why it's important. You know, we know that most Jewish young men are, are raised, and they read the five... I think, I'm not exactly sure, but they memorize the first five books of the Bible or they read through them. And, um, and they, these guys knew the history and they knew what, their, their, what it was all about for them and their life. And they weren't willing to let that go for the current pleasures of this world. They weren't, they weren't willing to do that. So in verse 8 it says, and Daniel purposed in his heart. We... Scholars believe that Daniel was between the age of 15 to 20 years old. He was young, and he was in a different world. He could have done, he could have did whatever, and he was at an a, a, a elevated position. He was being groomed to serve the king. He had everything. He had knowledge, good looks, and power, right? Kind of sounds familiar, the rich young ruler, right? Something similar. But I think Daniel counted those things, as the apostle Paul says, as rubbish, for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ or of God, right? And we see in these first couple of verses, you know, we, we, we see in verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies nor the wine. Something very interesting here, if you think about it for a second, right? He didn't fight the name change. He didn't fight the education system. He fought the food. 
That seems like the most insignificant thing, right? Why the food? It seems like if somebody's trying to change who you are, you'd want to fight that, right? Or if somebody's trying to educate you with something that you don't believe, you would, you'd want to fight that, but he, it's, the, it's the food? Why the food? Why did he not want to de- defile himself? The, the Greek word for defile is literally polluting. Daniel knew who he was, right? So you can call Daniel whatever he, you want, and people can call Christians or us whatever they want, but as long as we know who we are, we can stand solid, right? No matter what people say, right? Even the people who are flattering us. Daniel knew who he was. Why would he have to fight that? Daniel chose his battle very wisely. But they're educating him in the things that are not of God. Daniel knew what he believed. So it didn't matter. they could tell him whatever they want. They can give whatever history they want, everything they want. Daniel knew exactly what he believed. And that was, those are two important things that Daniel knew who he was and he knew what he believed. And that's important for us and for our children, right? Know who you are and know what you believe. Because you could stand in any situation if we, if, if, if we have those two things. But defiling himself, he knew that that was against the Jewish law. And if you put it spiritually, it's what we put in, right? The food probably wasn't kosher. The food was sacrificed to idols and the wine. So it might seem like a small thing, but it's when we deny ourselves of the small thing, God prepares us for the battles of the bigger things, right? He was, he, he, Daniel said, no, I can't. That's one thing I can't do is I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat, partake of this food. It'll pollute me. It will pollute me. I don't want to be dependent on this. The easiest thing became the biggest thing because God wanted to use Daniel mightily. And he did for many years, right? Why, why, is, why is this part important? Why is the food part important? It's because, you know, like, we need to think about, you know, the Bible tells us this. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but I will not be under the power of any. Daniel did not want to be under the power of the king's delicacies or wine. Was it okay for him to do it? Actually not during that time because he was Jewish. Could he do it during that time? Yes. Because the king of that nation was telling him to do it. He, they could have forced him. But it's interesting that it says God gave him favor with those people. And when we obey God, God will give us favor with different people, with different, the people around us, even move things around for us. And I love this because it's very important. Daniel, you know, you could think he's making a big deal out of something so small, but you know what? It's important for us, Christians, friends, not to cut corners, right? I'm not being legalistic. I'm just being like, you know what? The Apostle Paul said, I don't want to be caught, I don't want to be brought under the power of anything. And in my life, I've, I, I, I know, and I've, and I've caught myself, something has, has, has control in my life. And I pray, God, deliver me from this. Help me through these things, God. I'm not perfect. And only you and God know what those things are. But I love that picture there because I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, we don't want to do anything that's going to make us feel as if we're not obeying God. We're, we're under grace. The grace of God is a beautiful thing. The Bible says, for he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become righteous to God. God sees us through the blood of his son, perfect. And I want, my, I want my life and I want my actions and I want my everything that I do to please God. Not out of labor, 
or anything else but out of love. And I think that was something that Daniel maybe felt in his heart. We don't know. We just, we, we, we just see that he's, he stood his ground. You see, and I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wrapping it up right now, but uh, the names that they were given to them are interesting. I, took, I, I got the definitions of the names of what they mean in Hebrew and what they meant in the, other, in the language of the Chaldeans. Um, Daniel, the meaning of that name is God is my judge. That's interesting, right? He knew that, you know, no matter what, only God can judge me. His name was changed to Belshazzar, meaning Bel's prince. They were trying to exalt him. Hananiah, meaning beloved by the Lord, was changed to Shadrach, meaning illumined by the sun god. It's kind of creepy. Um, but, you know, it's, I love that picture too. Like, God's love is enough. It's not with anything else, whatever type of illumination or fame or anything else, God's love was enough. The name Mishael, meaning who is as God, was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus. And Azariah, meaning the Lord is my help, was changed to Abednego, meaning servant of Nego. And so they were, again, trying to move them from, from the trust in the love of God into the trust and love of that government and culture and king and all these things. But we see that Daniel had favor not only with, 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 with um, the, the, this, this man that, he, that, that, that was set over them, but God, also God gave him knowledge in all literature, wisdom, and Daniel had understanding of visions and dreams. And we see here that Daniel, after the time that no one was seen, I mean, no one was like him. He was, those boys were 10 times better than the rest because God gave them the knowledge. God gave them understanding. God gave them favor. All they did was walk. And the, and the only way they knew how at that time, just like us, we walk in God's favor because of what Christ did on the cross for us, amen? And I just want to encourage you guys here today, you know, um, I want to encourage you that we need ourselves to, to purpose in our heart because it's so easy to get caught up in the sway of things in this world. Believe me, I talk to people, whether it's youth, whether it's adults, whether they're working in the, the tech industry or whether they work, you know, for the city or where they work ever, and, and, and Christian brothers and sisters, and they ask me to pray. They say, man, I'm so influenced sometimes. So many things, and I want to talk about things when people are talking, and I know, I know I shouldn't be doing that because s slowly I'm just getting caught up and everything else, and I think it's important, just as Daniel did, but, is to, you know, to, to, to be determined, to be like, you know what, I want to I be set apart and holy unto God. I want, I want my life... You, you know, what's interesting, I, I read a proverb, and I don't remember the exact um, address of it, but it said something, or I, I heard somewhere, maybe it might, be, might not be a proverb, but to have honor is better than fame. A lot of people want to be famous or known, but to have honor because of who you are, your integrity and the person you are and the God you follow and to have respect, it's better than being popular or fame. And I'm not telling uh, you guys out there to be the bah humbug, you know, the person that's always no or, or always arguing, just be who God has created you to be, amen? You know, the Bible says in John 5, 24, he says, most, Jesus says, most surely I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in me who has sent me has everlasting life and should not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. We are truly alive now, friends. We reflect our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think it's important for us 
to live our lives like the moon and reflect the sun. Amen? So I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And, and I just, you know, I, I think during this time right now, if we can just pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the new believers. There's, there's, there's been 60 new salvations um, that, I, that I, the, the people that I've, been, that I've led to the Lord in the last, since June. Pray for them. Pray for peace in our communities. Pray for uh, that God will be glorified. Yeah.